Hello and welcome to The Last ND, a board game podcast coming to you from a trio of freeing countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alessio. Hello. And Alexis. From Belgium. Bonjour. And I'm your host, Audrey. Hi. Today we're going to be talking about Frontier Scum, Cult Express, and War of Chests. But first of all, it's time for The Last ND catch up. What have you been doing, Alessio, lately? Oh, well, uh, this really depends. Depends on what day is today, but probably I'll be very generic about this. I, I have, as you know, I've been playing a lot of Spirits and Hildegard lately, so I'm trying to fetch the la, the very few, uh, the very last few endings of the game, which I I have to say is still surprising, and. I am playing a bit of Aeon Trespass Odyssey, yes, uh, oh. trying to go in around cycles, so uh, this is probably uh, uh, not changing a lot since last update, so basically that's basically it. Uh, an interesting side note could be that I actually played uh, a lot of Marvel Snap, I went finally to gold, which is a lot, but I am scrapped here because I, I didn't even pay to win. Actually, it's not pay to win, absolutely, but I didn't pay to get cards and levels earlier, so it is a bit of an achievement. I, I, I think I could want to talk about it uh, one episode or another because it's kind of board gamey. No, no. But, <laughs> but that's it, anyway. So what have you uh, been up to, Alexis? Well, on my end, um, I've started playing uh, the list of uh, top 20 uh, solo game in uh, BGG for the for end of the year catch up. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that we, we are going to discuss that at some point. Uh, you, me and Or ben. we have discussed them. <laughs> Uh, no, it is probably going to be in the future. This, yeah. is, uh, <laughs> this is going to be our end of the year episode. No need to um, be meta again. Exactly. Yeah, never met up. <laughs> um, uh, I'm also uh, I've I'm also going to start a campaign of uh, the Call of Cthulhu um, collectible card game with uh, with Fen at some point. So I'm looking forward to discuss uh, some of that uh, later. Oh, Arkham Horror LCG. Yeah, I heard about that. Are you yeah, having fun? Uh, uh, no, we are going to start. So well, <laughs> okay. I guess when this episode is uh, is out, we will have started already. But uh, again, no matter this time. We, we um, will discuss it. I, I love that game. Yes, we will talk about it later. Uh, and I'm also uh, going to play some uh, RPG stuff in the coming week. So I'm very excited for this. Uh, lots of stuff that is upcoming. But uh, for now, let's focus on the present and ask Audrey, uh, what's up with you? Uh, I, again, not much. Uh, I, I almost feel like I'm doing the same answers over and over again. Uh, but no, actually, there are some so small uh, new things. I'm trying to clear my uh, schedule to make a bit more time to play games with my husband, actually, because it's something that we haven't done much during the second half of autumn, and I want to uh, have more time doing that uh, for the winter. Um, as the time of this recording, uh, he's also trying to find games to gift me for Christmas. Uh, I'm helping <laughs> him, let's say, find ideas. Uh, slightly um as well yes at the time of this recording i'm waiting on my package of aeon trespass odyssey and i think that, that by the time this podcast airs i will probably have played maybe two sessions <laughs> uh i'm really looking forward to it um the only downside for me is that i'm going to play alone <laughs> but i mean sometimes as well playing alone is not a bad thing so yeah uh, and yes, uh, Alessio, if you ever want to talk about Marvel Snap, please wait me because I think I'm, I can blame you, but I started playing it and my husband started, <laughs> pl started playing it as well. Uh, it's so, addictive, yeah? <laughs> so yeah, I, I think it's pretty fun. The only, f let's say, uh, not, not downside, but issue that I personally have with this type of games is that uh, my brain isn't 
made to get deck ideas somehow. Uh, so I'm just like sticking around the start and oh I don't like this one I'm taking it out and stuff like that which um, can be limiting at some point um, for me. Yeah, the, the, a friend of mine says that one person every 100 card game players is a deck builder and that's all of the ideas. Yeah, I, I'm definitely part of the 99 others. Oh yeah, me too. <laughs> so yeah, but uh, I mean, it's, it's I think it's it's a pretty fun game to be honest. Uh, so yeah, I'm having fun, um, and yeah, I think for me that's yeah, that, that's all for me. So so let, let, let's go on. <laughs> so we are going to take a trip and go far, 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 far to the. For West and Alexis is here to tell us about the role-playing game Frontiers Come. Yes, uh, so Frontiers Come is a game that came out uh, this year. If I'm yeah, it came out this year. Uh, it's a tabletop RPG that spins mock box rules into a weird West setting made by uh, Carl Druid. Uh, you can find it online on uh, Games Omnivorous in Europe, and I think that. Uh, Exalted Funeral is publishing it in, in the US. It is not a game based on the historical Far West, but rather on its myth and cliché. Uh, the way that they describe it uh, in, the, in the book is that while other uh, role-playing games draw inspiration from swords and uh, shield times, this game draws inspiration from guns and hats. Uh, so it, it is a game that kind of like keeps itself on the historical setting of the Far West and more focus on the the sort of mythology around it. Uh, and it is a very um, grungy uh, Series B type of uh, type of game, which I find uh, very interesting because it can then draw inspiration from some of the best um, Far West movie like uh, Dead Man or Bone Tomahawk or um, The Revenant. Um, so, uh, it sets the player as uh, grungy outlaws trying to scrunch money in the Lost Frontiers. Um, every town in the Lost Con uh, uh, Frontier is controlled by a large corporation that recently moved in and is, that is trying to buy everything. The law is mostly corrupt and serving that corporation and weird things have been crawling into the night. So the players are kind of those um, out of uh, outlaws, a social type character that I that are more hired gun than heroes. Uh, it's very fun. Uh, one of the things that I really want to highlight about the book is that it has this. Um, it has really a cool look because it looks like a, kit, a catalog from the late late 1800s uh, with adverts for bars, bicycle, liquors. It looks a bit more sober than the Morkbok books, but has about as much personality. I'm going to uh, paste some of that into our uh, recording chat and the uh, listeners can try to picture what it looks like in their head or go look at it on the website. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it looks it looks very fun, I think, in the, the way that the, the book is, is laid out and stuff. Very old school indeed. It, yeah. It's very Spaghetti Western-like. Remember, it's very the good, the bad, and Western. the ugly. Yeah, it's all it's all black and white and like a printed newspaper from the old uh, old Far West. It's very fun. So uh, in this game, as I mentioned, the characters that you play aren't heroes. They're kind of the bottom of the barrel. Uh, the system to create uh, them is very simple. You roll their full stats that you you'll use for pretty much every check. You pick an outlaw name, like for example, uh, Lemzy Flea Trap. Um, you roll your uh, the crime that got you wanted and your and your uh, reward, and then you get a class. You get some static equipment. You um, pick your horse and the horse's personality, and then you're ready to go. Uh, I really like the class for the games that are more like background and class. Um, they give you a couple of skills that will will define your character. So, for example. Um, you know, you, you're able to start a fire even in a blizzard because you were a frostbit prospector. Um, you get some loot, uh, some basic loot alongside that. The class are all kind of fun. Uh, you can you could be um, 
a butcher cook or a ghoulish undertaker or a charlatan and a fraud uh, all of the classic far west type characters tell are, are me kind of... there's a, there's a traveling salesman or something like that well the charlatan and fraud is the traveling sal- salesman yeah i, I, I uh, saw i saw on the cover the snake uh, a snake or oh, yeah. salesman yeah. oh you, you can definitely start as a, sta- a snake or sa- a salesman <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, and it it can be fun you can also start as a doctor with a diploma uh which i find quite fun yeah the federal agent like the FBI agent is there? No. Uh, no, you too, can't. Too powerful, you, too powerful. You, you can't be a discharged deputy, though. I, yeah. I'm, not anyway. really, I'm not really knowledgeable about Western in general, but uh, so far I would say that the only, let's say, Western uh, recent one that I have seen uh, is the Hateful Eight, and I do feel like what you're saying fits that setting. Oh, yeah. No, it would work really well to play uh, sort of Hateful Eight as, a, as an RPG. Uh, it's it's really it's really fun in the way that it it looks. Uh, one thing that I really like is that it has a couple of rules that I I think uh, are worth uh, at, um, outlining. Um, oh yeah, uh, so, so sorry, I'll, I'll cut this. Oops. So um, once your character is is ready, uh, one thing that you, you it needs to be pointed out is that just like Monkbok you don't have that many HP. Uh, the game isn't really meant for long stories and, and longer scenarios. Instead, it's clearly intended for one shot and shorter um, scenarios that will end in a blaze of glory or in retirement rather than you know your player pushing uh, through to multiple uh, month long yeah. campaigns. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it's, it's good to have uh, options that let you just do like a convention or an, uh, an evening with friends and yeah. not be committed. This game is really good for that because basically you can explain the rules in, in five minutes, you can get your character ready in maybe 10 and then be ready to, to roll. Uh, and the game is very ready to make your own fun with uh, whatever. You don't really need to, you know, uh, spend hours learning traits or or uh, understanding how your classes work. You can just have fun. Uh, there's a couple of rules that I, I appreciate and wanted to point out. Uh, so your inventory sp- uh, slot has spread on your body. You can carry up to three larger things on your back, um, three medium items on your belt, and ten small items your, in your pockets. Oh, that's Plus nice. You have your whole saddle. Yeah, I like this idea that like if you if you find something that is larger, well, you can only have like one or two of them because it's on, already on your back. You you need to carry your your backpack and then your long rifle and yeah, and that's about it. I, I kind of like this idea that it's very like um, quick to understand how this works. Yeah, uh, fast to play yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one rule that I find is is very fun. Uh, you don't have to include it, but I think it's it's kind of nice. Is that you have uh, your your favorite hat? You described how well, how your hat looks <laughs> like. Uh, whenever you take damage, you can decide that you lose your hat uh, to block all damage from a single attack. Oh, oh that's, that's beautiful, <laughs> like in a western. Yeah, that's exactly like in a western. Your, your I think step, that's... your stats on that uh, just jumps away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I find that uh, pretty amazing. Uh, the the combat rules are also very easy. The um, uh, NPC never roll. It's always either the player that rolls an attack or defense. Um, so it, it makes that everything is always in the hands of the player. It m- makes things a little bit feel a little bit more fair when you you get shot. It's because you miss your uh, defense roll, not because the GM rolled a, a double uh, six uh, for the fifth time in a row. Um, I I quite like also that the the way that the um, the gunfight works is that if you fire your, uh, your gun in a, an open setting you immediately hit uh, you don't have a you don't need to make a check but if you fire but if it's a tough shot so if someone is behind um, cover uh, cover or if there's a um, or if there's like a snowstorm and you're shooting at a distance then you need to make like a proper roll but if it's just a uh, shooting at a um, uh, in an open setting and like the the person isn't ready, boom, you you hit. You don't need to make a, a second shot. Uh, it it makes the 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 fight feel uh, feel fun. I kind of like those ideas. There's a bunch of little rules. Uh, one of the 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 ones that I like is that every type of condition, like being uh, unpoisoned or frostbit or exhausted, kind of falls onto the same thing that will give you um, just a basically a disadvantage to your roll. Um, 
but there's one that is that is as like a special little little thing on top of it is uh, being drunk. <gasps> when you're drunk, you exchange uh, two of your abilities. So, for example, and and you <laughs> do that uh, at, yeah. you do that at random. But the idea is that, well, for example, your strength could go down while your dexterity goes up because Beautiful. you exchange uh, your higher strength yeah. for your uh, de dexterity. So maybe you're the kind of fighter that needs to like take a swing of whiskey before you go into a fight because you're actually <laughs> aim better once you're a little bit drunk. I find that wonderful yeah. as an idea. I, I cannot keep the aim straight if, I, if they don't have a shot first. <laughs> exactly. You, you're too used to aim with your trembling hands. That's very thematic. Um, yeah, the, the game comes alongside uh, a first uh, little story that is basically like a train robbery, um, which it's like a, a dungeon crawler inside of a train. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about it because there's some weird stuff about it, but it is uh, it is quite fun to have your, just your, your character oh, if going up were... a train. There's a little bit of um, a Snowpiercer aspect to it, if you've seen that movie. Um, I've seen the TV show. Yeah, does it happen in a play, in a train? Uh, should, right? Yes, most uh, of it. Yeah, then then it's probably like kind of similar to that. I mean, I mean we are going to talk uh, about that in a few minutes anyway. Yeah, <laughs> if if only yeah. there was a game about the train robbery. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, in any case, that's that's basically like the the general gist of the game. Um, if if somebody likes uh, western and and shorter, quicker RPGs or Mogbok in general. I would definitely recommend to at least have a look at uh, Frontier Scum. Um, I will oops, just point out the name of the author once again. It is Caldred, and the game is uh, available on Games of Universe or in uh, Exalted Furnal. Uh, probably in other places too. I know that it's on Drive Thru uh, and you know uh, your favorite uh, RPG carrier book might have them. Uh, yeah, definitely. yeah, that is that is Frontier Scam. Gonna uh, check it higher out. Higher condition only. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so I, I think for people looking for something a bit more grim, that uh, could be cool. Yeah, exactly. And speaking of grim, we are indeed going. We are now going to go from the far west. Uh, no, sorry. And speaking of which, we are going to move to a more child-friendly forward setting. It's time for Colt Express. Colt Express, which is again designed by Christophe Rimbaud and published by uh, Ludonaut. Um, it's a game for two to six players about Far West bandits robbing a train. Who could have guessed? <laughs> Each player will control one of the uh, robbers, uh, which are all uh, we, which all have a small uh, different ability, and uh, they all have cards, same cards, allowing them to do actions. In the box, for you have to first before any game, you have to assemble a train. So that's going to be yes, a, a cardboard that train. Beautiful. Yeah, you have the cardboard train, and you have the meeples for the uh, robbers that you are going to move. Up yeah. or down the train to go on the roof or inside the train to move uh, forward or backwards the train and you are going to be able to shoot uh, the other bandits these are the main things that you will do on the train and each um, game will be played in f I think it's four uh, different uh, rounds and uh, you will have a card for each round that says how you play your character cards, your action cards, because sometimes the train can go under a tunnel and not everyone can see which cards the other players are playing. And so the players will play the cards in turn, either face up, face down, two at the same time, etc, etc, depending on the travel of the train. And at the end of the round, all the cards will be resolved. So that means that if at some point you put a card that, um, let's say, ma makes you go up uh, the, tr the train, and then you play this card, well, your character is inside the train, so you have to go up the train. If you play the card that makes you shoot a, a bullet, then at the time of the resolving of the card, it's when you check who, which targets you have. So... You can do a little bit of manipulation because if you remember that a player 
put on the stack a card of shooting and you had a movement card uh, either forwards or backwards of the train. Just before that, you can decide to move further from that player and have someone else between them and you so that the player between them and you is the one taking the bullet. So that means that when you play the things, when you play the cards, is not exactly the moment where you know exactly which effect it will have. And, and I think that is uh, a pretty smart thing because uh, it's not as simple as it seems and you have to remember a bit who played which cards and how you can um, manage around that at the moment of resolving the cards. And on the um, booklet they say that it's a game for uh, 10 plus years old and I think that it's not definitely not a game too much for kids because you do have to use that memory uh, to to remember and then try to counteract or prevent things. And I, I think that's something that is very interesting and can be fun uh, with families uh, uh, still, but not too young kids. And I, yes, I, I remember playing this uh, a few years back. I think at the convention. And one thing that I really liked about this idea of like you're not very sure what your card is going to do and you kind of have to to deal with the other players is that it kind of reminded me a bit of a, a poker game uh, a little bit there's there's this slight notion of bluffing and trying to i, I think that fits really well with the, the far west aspect yeah 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 it's, it's very funny because you are going to shoot but who and uh, you can also loot uh, items that are on the train. This is one specific card. But at the moment that you loot, um, that you play the card, maybe something will have changed. And maybe you think you're going to be at this place, but actually you're not going to be actually here because someone is going to shoot at you and that someone has a power that says that, oh, if I shoot that person, I make them move a wagon and then you are at a place where there is nothing to loot. Uh, etc etc and uh, yeah it, it's very funny because you don't know exactly when you play and at the end the winner is the one who got the most money uh, from the train yep and, and uh, that's so simple yeah and that's the one who shot the mass bullets gets a bonus <laughs> Yeah, that's the extra thing. You do have uh, six bullets, I think, total to shoot. And each time you use the action to shoot a bullet, you take one bullet card and you give that to the player that you hit. And that player has to add it to their own deck. So that means it's a dead card for the future rounds. And so being smart when shooting uh, can be very useful to annoy a bit your other uh, friends or families. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, of, and of course, uh, that, that you have a cult that's six shots. <laughs> yep, I, 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 ex exactly. Yeah, <laughs> beautiful. That, that's very thematic. But I, I actually, where you know that there's a French designer on a game when you see stuff like this. The meeples are gorgeous. The 3D train is fun. <laughs> there's a lot of mechanic of moving around and stuff. And there's a, a very smart planning, actually. Uh, I got this game demoed. Uh, I think uh, I think it was uh, two years ago in Perugia on a store. I I I remember uh, to a store in inauguration. I, I remember that uh, I basically played my rounds just uh, guessing that the opponent would play to leverage their own special ability. So it was, uh, uh, you, you said that, that you used a lot of memory, it's that, and it's also I have a hunch about what the opponent is going to do because they have this ability and they will use it. Yeah. yeah that was and... fun, actually. I, I wanted to play again, so I, it left a positive impression. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's fun and it's smarter than it looks. The only thing I would say is that uh, it's not much of a recent game anymore. No. Um, <laughs> and uh, the design and things are starting to, I'm going to say, show a bit of age. Mm -hmm. um, and the artwork, also, surely. <laughs> yeah, and also that uh, you have two uh, female characters and they are very stereotypical, very uh, nat native uh, American and hmm. the girl uh, in skirts and yeah, something a bit more inventive could have been cool. Oh, understood. Yeah. 
And there is an expansion! Whoa! You have the diligence and the... Oh, I forgot to, to mention the sheriff, that there is a sheriff meeple that's going around and messing up with you. And on the expansion you have the diligence that's next to the train and I think there are something to have sheriffs as well going around on horses. Wow, beautiful. I, I don't know anything about the expansion anyway. <laughs> I actually was gifted it, and uh, I'm guilty of never playing it. <laughs> guilty it of does job. look really nice, though. Okay, so we know there's an expansion. Yeah, and and uh, in both cases, uh, both the core box and the expansion, uh, the uh, insert, let's say it's a cardboard uh, insert that's very simple, but you have all the room to store your built train and diligence. So the space was well uh, conceived. Well organized. Yeah, well they, organized. They, they thought uh, before about, about the expansion. Yeah, and you have extra tokens with cacti and stuff like that. It's completely useless, but you can put them on the table. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I, I see the, the rocks, the mountains. Yeah. But it looks nice. Yeah, it yeah. It has yeah. So now we're going, I, to, we're going to yeah. go from the far west looters to princes and hares learning how to be general. It is Alessio with War of Chests. Wow, you, you, you did the homeworks. I yeah. did the homework, yes! <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, War Chest is a game about... Uh, it's actually an abstract game. The theme around the game is that uh, uh, a young king had his firstborn son and uh, his old general and tutor uh, gifted him uh, uh, War Chest, which is uh, an abstract game uh, to learn about moving troops and waging war. So uh, this is what you are actually doing. You, uh, uh, as it is written in the box, you are doing, uh, you are playing a game of kings uh, who learn to be kings. So that's it. So if, if, if I may, War of Chess is a game where you actually play a character playing a game. Yeah, actually, the game is absolutely abstract. It's <laughs> chess like in that you have chips and you have a bag. But I'm talking about this. Uh, so uh, you basically have to know that uh, this game is by David Thompson and Trevor Benjamin, uh, who I think everyone we remember for uh, Undaunted and for actually War Chest, but we will uh, cover this uh, in a while. And uh, it is, I think, a 2018 game. I don't want to be wrong about this. It's going, it has been going around in my house uh, since the COVID hit, so it's a treasure possess possession of mine. And uh, basically the game is... Uh, two players, it can be played also in four players, uh, but it's two players, so two uh, different teams uh, trying to control pieces on a map, which is an X-Grid. There are special squares called locations, uh, control points, and if uh, the, the first team who achieves uh, control of six control points uh, wins. Uh, now, uh, how to play? You basically have a bag and uh, you can draft at the beginning four ta different types of units. Uh, each of these different types of unit follows the same rules for movement and cheats, but they have special attributes and special rules which are uh, specific to them. So you draft and counter draft trying to pick uh, the best uh, the best combination to go against the, your opponent. Uh, after that, you basically put two tokens of each uh, unit in a bag. The rest of the tokens are in a reserve on uh, your side of the board. You uh, put another token, which is the royal coin, which has, uh, let's say, special powers, but we will get on this. And uh, every round, each player takes, draws three tokens from a bag, keeps them secret, and then in turn they play one at a time. You have basically three kinds of actions, which are actions wi uh, which place tokens on the board. So you can uh, either place one token on the board representing a unit, 
or you can bolster an existing unit of, of the type by putting another token of the same type on top of that unit. Which is uh, more convenient to do with chips than with stuff like dice or meeple. Yeah, absolutely. And that represents a, a stronger unit, which is uh, uh, like two, uh, let's say you have a swordsman, you have two swordsmen or two footmen. Uh, you cannot have two different ch uh, chip stacks of the same unit. So you always have uh, one unit of uh, swordsmen. Uh, one unit of pikemen, one unit of bannermen, and so on. But uh, how big is the unit? Yeah, of course. The uh, the only exception is the footman, which can be uh, placed into units, but there's uh, their attribute, and we will talk about this uh, in a bit. Uh, why this is important? Because your board has a limited uh, your your bag has a limited. Uh, as, as a limited quant quantity of tokens which can go in there and when you remove a token uh, to place it on the table it won't go in the board again it is important because when you want to move those token on the board you have to spend one token of the same type so let's say i have uh, two swordsman token i put one on the board uh, i will have always one remaining token to move, to move, to attack and to control the sites with it uh, for my unit. This is called ma maneuvering. You can spend one token face up to try to do one of these actions, which is move, you move one square. You attack, you simply take an adjacent enemy and you remove one token from their stack. If the last token is removed, the, the enemy is defeated and control if you are on a control point which is not controlled by your opponent you can place your control token and that's your control point from there uh, onwards unless of course the uh, the opponent steals it back these are the the, the three actions you can do with uh, with a face up token there is another kind of action you can do with a face down token which is basically recruiting so you pick a token from your reserve and you put it in your discard pile so that you can add it to your bag so that's the way you can for instance uh, if you had the two swordsmen like in the previous example you put one in the in, on the board uh, you use the another to another token to move the swordsman you can just put from your reserve another swordsman token on the discard pile so that it goes in the bag when you are done with uh, tokens, it's done. Uh, you can steal initiative with a face down token or you can uh, just pass with it. So that's basically all there's to know about the game. The game is beautiful. The most important part of the game is trying to manage your bag while trying to uh, manage your space, your, uh, your area control on the board. Because basically, uh, when your bag is empty, you fill it with this card, but uh, the pieces which are killed from the board don't go to this card, but are removed from the game. So you will eventually end up with a bag containing only the pieces you are not using. It, it's also important to point out that um, since your, your tokens are used to issue orders to your units, you kind of have to decide how many you want on your board as a bolstered piece yeah. or, and has, uh, how many you want uh, in your bag to be able to give more orders for your characters to move. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of an advanced strategy that you reduce the size of, the, of your bag to just exactly the tokens you need. Uh, you can... Uh, uh, tell a, a new player of war chest because they keep recruiting the uh, when you become become expert with the game you learn that you bolster the unit you don't want so you keep uh, only the activation you want there are units who, who actually get a lot of uh, of power from being bolstered there are units who can use the berserker which is a very powerful unit for instance is a unit uh, we can be bolstered up to five and when you 
finally activate the berserker you uh, can keep removing from the top of the berserker because it goes in a in a self damaging rage you can remove tokens you can discard tokens from the berserker to make it have extra actions so uh, you basically pile up stuff on the berserker then in uh, one uh, one uh, go you just keep have them move attack move attack and so on uh, it's uh, it's actually a game with a big learning curve but the, the this learning curve is beautiful because uh, in a game of war chest you are a new player you are playing against an expert player you get pounded uh, to the ground but at the end of uh, of the game you know exactly what you did wrong that's actually something that i wanted to to ask you uh, because i've i've only uh, played uh, played around with the game on tabletop simulator read the yeah. rules kind of got the gist of it but i've not played it yet <laughs> uh the units are all very different in terms of strength there's clearly units that seem to be a lot stronger than other and because at the start of your uh, of the game you you pick your your tokens uh, randomly right uh, uh let's say uh, you draft if you, them. if you yeah if you play exactly the draft you draft eight units and then you draft like the first player get get to draft the first item then you draft two units then the first player draft uh, uh, another two units then you draft two units and the first player takes the remaining one yeah, that's that's kind of my my question is the how balanced is the game because I kind of feel like you could easily end up with uh, by by a, by chance not having the the right uh, not having a good a good hand of uh, of characters, which is it's the only big difference with uh, with well not the only big difference with chess, but like that that's one of the reasons why chess is is always so considered a, a great tactical game because you you go wrong with the exact same okay uh, yeah armies. Oh, here oh. because of the, the the difference the asymmetry i'm kind of wondering yeah i i can address this question okay uh, let me tell this in all drafting games usually the drafting phase is where you win or lose the game okay if you do a poor draft actually it's not where you win or lose the game it, when you draft, it's where you lose the game, because if you draft poorly, you have no chance except to lose. Now, the drafting mechanism of War Chest, I find it, uh, I, I assume we are talking of just the base game, uh, the drafting part of War Chest is pretty balanced, uh, meaning that since you are the first player, you have the first pick. And that is very powerful. But the uh, second player gets to draft two in two at once. So if you need to have a combo, the second player has the chance of removing that combo completely. Mm. All the same, if you are the first player and you want to pick, let's say, an S tier, uh, an S tier uh, piece because you really want that you are leaving your opponent free game of the on the combos all the same okay. uh, I see. yeah the, the, the drafting is pretty balanced i have to say that in the base game only there are especially if you don't have because there's there there is a uh, there is a unit w w that's the royal guard uh, which was initially uh, a bit more powerful or perceived a bit more powerful than the others because uh, it made use of the royal token. I, I don't say this uh, before, but you have a, a nine token at the beginning, which is the royal token. The royal token is a token you can basically play only face down in the best game. So uh, you can use it to recruit, to get initiative or to pass. And uh, the Royal Guard has a tactic, so uh, an, uh, an activated ability, which uses the Royal Token to move. So it basically 
gets the chance of having an extraction. Uh, added to that, the Royal Guard has the fact that it is not actually removed from play when it's attacked because you can decide to discard from your reserve instead of from table the pieces when the Royal Guard is it. So you have a piece which basically moves once more than the others and stays on the on the board taking poundings and uh, giving back uh, strikes and keep keeping keeping uh, multiplying its staying power for a lot of time so uh, there are pieces which you might want because they are powerful standing alone so by, by themselves but if you do, you usually remove a combo. It's true that there are t uh, there are power tires in this game, but uh, it's true. It's also true that uh, uh, your fourth pick is probably the the least powerful or the least matching the least the, the the unit least matching your strategy. So you keep it as fourth pick. But there's always a chance that you can use it in combination with something else. So while a piece by itself uh, is probably not that powerful, it's the full drafting which always has a way to be played. So I'd say that the game is fairly balanced. Uh, One would hope so. <laughs> yeah, th that should it should be said that the two expansion after that did a great job at making the, ga the game perfectly balanced. I'd say that uh, there are two expansions to this game, there's Siege and Nobility, and uh, Nobility is the first one, and it's the most important one, because uh, it gives you a way to uh, use the Royal Token to do more stuff, and because uh, it adds the decrees, at the beginning of, of the game you shuffle uh, a deck of seven decrees and pick three, which are special actions which can be taken once in the game by each of the players by spending the royal token. So uh, if you have this royal token, you can use it to 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 make a decree, a, a decree, and that decree uh, is a special action which is not a special power of which is usually not a special power of your units, and allows you to break the rules a bit and gives you one added uh, decision space and uh, and the expansion comes with units which leverage this in favor or in combo or counter picking other units more powerful the second uh, and with nobility you have actually achieved a, a, a big deal of balance because uh, everyone could use the royal token uh, Decently, you always have something which uh, you you have the options of using a decree when there's, for example, something uh, on board. The, there's a decree which is called sacrifice, which allows you to uh, attack with a unit and then remove a unit, even if you don't have a co uh, and if even if you don't have the coin for that unit. So uh, it basically allows you to break the rules a bit in your favor. Depend ignoring the draft you have and that's powerful and that uh, balances a bit more evens out the most powerful chips from the base game that's uh, at that point the game only had uh, one problem basically which was that nobody wanted to bolster units because they wanted to keep uh, chips around uh, fill their bag and do stuff the second expansion, Siege, which is a bit more underwhelming at first impression because it only adds fortifications, which is basically that some, contro some control points have one HP more before being conquered. Uh, siege allows you to take Siege tactics, which are special powers which can be used only by bolstered units. So at this point, you have uh, extra reasons to to bolster uh, except from uh, uh, from removing tokens from your bag and i think the games is pretty complete now it's completely balanced in my opinion or at least it's fairly balanced fairly enough to not rage when you lose
<laughs> so that's it basically. Yeah, I think, I think two things I like uh, in that which are pretty general actually, it's that um, the chips are uh, usage which make you bolster and stuff. Uh, but I mean, we there are not many games using chip. I mean, of course, there's chip theory games are uh, doing. Yeah. Exclu- uh, almost exclusively games with chips now, uh, since there is one to make it lie. Um, and so I think it's pretty nice to see other games with uh, chips uh, that aren't uh, chip theory games. Um, and um, I think that also the drafting from a bag mechanic, which, I mean, it, it's not very um, evoluted, it's not very original or something. But, uh, I mean, not many games do that. And yeah, I think yeah. that it's something, I, w- I will not say it's elegant, but um, you can have nice bags with uh, nice drawings and stuff like that. And I think it's cute or fun to have a nice bags. And it is not very rocket science to do that. And I think that more games could actually use that kind of back drawing mechanic. Yeah, uh, uh, back building is a mechanic which is underused. But I have to say, perhaps with the exception of Sheriff of Nottingham, which is a game I like, but it's a bit on the simple, boring side after a while, all games with back building are beautiful. I, I think of Arkham Horror, I think of War Chest, I think of Vagrant Song. They are beautiful games and... Uh, uh, Arkham Horror is probably a classic in card games, uh, even if it's if it begins to show his age. But uh, I I can say this: uh, I'm kind of a, a passionate about uh, I kind of passionate about the uh, competitive games one versus one. But War Chest is the game I keep returning to, uh, along with Resarcana. These are two games uh, which I keep playing over and over when I have the chance. So, uh, I don't know, probably my review is this game is an instant classic. It's a game you see and you know it will stay in your collection because it's beautiful. Uh, I, I, I didn't spend a word about the components, but the components are cloth bags, beautiful. Uh, th- th- they are heavy, they are of heavy cloth, they are beautiful. You have uh, uh, a normal cardboard uh, board and uh, you have chips which are done with, uh, I think it's uh, metal resin the one you use uh, to make uh, metal me- metal miniatures without the fire. Uh, th- th- they are heavy chips, beautiful core. And the game has a beautiful table presence. The chest is a small chest full of chips. It's uh, really, really uh, aesthetically pleasing. It's uh, beautiful to play. It's short, fast and fun. And uh, I cannot stress this enough, Uh, even if the more expert player always wins, when you play against a more experienced player, you know, you will know exactly where you, what you did wrong and how you can improve. Uh, If you want, you can try and play this game with uh, very experienced players on yukata.de or on warchestonline.com uh, there are also expansions in the, in uh, warchestonline.com you can play this game you will play against experienced players then after you lost because you will lose you can look back at your game and see oh that's what i did wrong and that's very important to me in this kind of games because uh, the your biggest uh, opponent in uh, competitive games is frustration. If you keep losing and you don't know why, you'll get frustrated. It doesn't happen with War Chest. Hmm. It seems it seems to be very easy to understand the game, but hard to master. The kind of uh... yeah, the, the kind of best games. Yes. And with and with that final token placement, we are out of time for this post, for this podcast. Thank you for listening to the last standy. You can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash TheLastTandy on YouTube or subscribe on your preferred podcast app. Sweet farewell from Alicia. 
Goodbye. Alexis? From Belgium. Au revoir. And myself? Au revoir. And remember that the second E in Standy is for equine. Mm.